Thank you very much, Harold. Um, we're going to continue to talk about um, the business of tomorrow's food. Uh, we will have our first panel, and I would like to introduce to you the moderator, somebody who you know by his first name, but maybe not by his face yet. It's uh, Sigi Hilmarsson from Iceland, came to New York, missed his Icelandic favorite breakfast, and instead of just complaining, he did something about it, and I think we can hear you say a few words about it before you start moderating uh, your panel. Welcome, Sigi. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> thanks for having me all. I'm excited to host today. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on, on, on my stuff, but uh, I started making yogurt in my kitchen, actually a few blocks down from here on, on Franklin Street. And uh, mostly, first of all, because I missed skier, which is the sort of thick yogurt of Iceland that the, the Vikings brought over from Scandinavia. But also because I felt there was a lot of sugar in American yogurt. Uh, it, was, it was overly sweet. And I wanted this sort of my thick protein mass to come with very little sugar and very simple ingredient. So I kind of made my own. Uh, on my way, I, I ran into Errol here. And, and he picked it up on a couple of other stores. And, uh, we went from about uh, we went from a farmers market and a and a and a single cheese store in Manhattan to about twenty five thousand stores today. So it's been a kind of a crazy journey. Um, yeah, um, but yeah, and driven apart not necessarily by my uh, masterful marketing efforts, but partially because Americans are really really waking up to the importance of of looking at it, especially sugar in the diet. But sugar was kind of a an afterthought after everybody was kind of crazy in the 80s about taking the fat out of stuff. So now f sugar is firmly on the map again, and, and that sort of has been a boon to my, my business and sort of my philosophy. But anyway, I would like to welcome the panelists down here. I, I see some of them over there. And uh, uh, I think we'll just sit down here and, 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 and sort of dive into a little bit of a lighter topic. We're going to try to keep it light and, and, and sort of brainstorm what the future bears in, uh, uh, ahead of us. Shall I, shall I sit in the middle? That's great, 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 great. 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 You can tell who the corporate guys are. The corporate guys? Ah, OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, before I dive in, we're, we're going to talk about the, the future of food. And, and, and predicting the future is always, always hard. We're now in, in 2016. And for those of you who are science fiction fans, uh, I'd like to remind you that Blade Runner is set in the year 2019, which is three years from now. So um, <laughs> before we dive in, uh, maybe, Errol, you start quickly with a quick introduction. I know you gave. <clears throat> a sure. Uh, was at Whole Foods Market for 14 years, been in the food industry for over two decades, and uh, dedicated my career to a uh, growing holistic and organic uh, food production system. Jonathan Atwood, uh, I'm with Unilever North America. Um, been there five years. Before that, I lived in Vermont and had a farm. Uh, Wesley Scott, uh, part of uh, Scott Barrett Foods. We're a contract manufacturer um, that produces for the food manufacturing industry. I uh, worked there most of my life um, producing different food products for a lot of the large CPG brands around the world. And my name is Scott Devot. I'm the uh, um, head of IKEA US Food. I'm, uh, if you call the Chief Meatball Officer for the, for the US. Um, uh, with the company for 20 years, in the food part now for, uh, for close to four, and been part of our food journey that I hope I can uh, speak to a little bit uh, as we go through this panel. And maybe we, maybe we just start with you, Jared. Um, the question that we're going to try to tackle here is, is what is the future? And uh, I'm going to put you all on the spot right away and say, what do you think are sort of the major food trends that the consumer is going to want to see in their food products and in, in their consumption habits for the next, let's say, 10 to 20 years? Yeah. I think, I mean, it was a very interesting uh, uh, journey so far, uh, mm -hmm. listening to the uh, presentations. I think there is, uh, there's a lot to be said about um, the awareness uh, increasing about you know, clean foods, what's in the food. Uh, people care about what they put in their mouth. They want to they wanna know what's... Uh, uh, what's in it, and they care about the brand. I think uh, as, a, as a retailer, as a food business, 
you want to stand for something other than just providing delicious food. And I think that is uh, where we found ourselves on our journey. Uh, you know, we, uh, uh, we've had restaurants in IKEA stores, I don't know if you've been to one, uh, since the 1950s. And we started out with, uh, you know, we called the restaurants the best meatball seller because uh, it's hard to do business with hungry customers. So we, uh, we felt, you know, just by providing them a meal, we can engage them. Um, but about six years ago, we started to realize this is a really missed opportunity um, to engage the customer and to be a, a visual example of the sustainability strategy that IKEA has uh, and engaging people on that level. So uh, we've actually started to align our range development for the offer that we provide in food with the furniture development. Every dish that we include has to score well on five dimensions. It's, uh, you know, the obvious things is form, function, and quality. You know, the resources, the, the ingredients that we use, uh, the quality, of course, has to be there. But we also put sustainability and affordability in there. And, uh, you know, one example is the, uh, the, um, the salmon journey that we've had, where now everything is ASC certified. Uh, and we were actually so proud of our salmon burger that we put it on the back of the catalog, which is the first time ever that a food product has made it. So I think there's, there's a lot to be done about, uh, you know, transparency in, uh, in food, better ingredients, and, and honestly, better choices. America's big on choice. We always want the option to, of indulgence, but I think as a retailer, we have an opportunity and also an obligation with our reach to uh, provide better choices and educate people. Yeah. Last thing. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's, it was important to highlight first just to start, there's been a, rightfully so a lot of focus on fresh food and, and trying to maximize uh, the nutritional value and access to, to, for everybody to healthy food. But there's also a role um, for secondary processors. It's very difficult to eat healthy all the time, fresh. And so, you know, involving um, the secondary processors as part of the conversation is important too. Um, and it's hard to um, disagree with uh, some of the commentary around uh, the impact that the meat industry is having um, on the planet um, and trying to provide more ingredients that are uh, nutritional, plant-based, and, and sustainable. So um, for us, you know, as a, as a secondary manufacturer, um, as far as trends and where products are going, convenience is still really an important uh, element of that and how... Uh, people get access to um, affordable, convenient um, foods that, are, that taste, taste good. So um, that's really where a lot of our growth has come from, uh, working with a lot of the brands. It's, uh, it's very interesting dealing with um, a lot of the large CPG brands as a co-manufacturer. We get to see you know, where they think the trends are going first. And you know, at the same time, we're working with lots of startup brands um, that want to use our infrastructure as a, as a contract manufacturer. So seeing what they're trying to do. Um, and, you know, I, I find it really interesting to see how we're going to uh, progress uh, and get the conversation about plant-based sustainable foods up to those larger brands and what that's going to look like. So, um, and then, yeah, uh, looking at the CPG brands and, and the responsibility that they have um, to promote this movement so well that's a great segue to my next guest here thank you Siggy and uh, you're the hero to my 11 year old we oh, go to Whole Foods and says we got to get Siggy I, I didn't know what that was until recently and, <laughs> and uh, now I do and now smart I know, man which is great um, so I'm gonna echo Garrett's comments because I think much of what I would have said would be the same uh, around more choices around more consumer information um, and, and really thinking that through. I think the other thing I would say, and maybe it's, maybe it's bold, maybe it's not, but I think as, as a large company, you know, we're a multi-billion dollar food company. We're, you know, we're operating in 190 countries. We're all over the world. I think our, our level of responsibility has gotten very clear to us now. Uh, I think that we and, and other large food companies, I think, have done a disservice over the last 20 years where we've stripped out the ingredients to make profits. And let's just, I, I think we just need to be honest about that. And I think we're on the way back now. So I would say a trend for us is to restore the trust um, between our company and consumers about 
who we are, who we want to be, know that we're on a journey, know that we are a mainstream food company. You know, I love what Paul you're talking about. I love what Michael and uh, and my good friend Marcus was talking about last night. But we're talking about feeding billions every day. Mm -hmm. And so, how do we how do we start and get into the process of looking at our business, looking at what impacts we have. We're a row crop commodity kind of company where we have big soybeans and big rice and big wheat. And so we undertake uh, systemic change exercises in places like Iowa where we go, go in and try to change the whole system. And it's long and it's arduous and we are prepared to go the long, you know, take the long run here to change the way that the farmers are farming. Uh, we're talking about regenerative agriculture. We're talking about that with the farmers. We're talking about the runoff that's going into the Gulf of Mexico. We're trying to sustain you know, the planet, obviously, but we have a role to play. We have a, con a convening power as a, as a big company. And, and we feel like this is very, very serious. And we have to maintain, obviously, the taste of our product, the, the value of our product, and do the right thing at the same time. So that's where we are. And it's, it's, it, we're on an interesting journey, I, I would say. Uh, you know, we, we, I don't think we disclose as much as we need to disclose. Mm -hmm. I think that through social media and other places now, we're getting much more feedback from consumers about what they, what they want to know, and now it's time for us to deliver. And so we, maybe we'll talk about that in a bit, but we have mechanisms now where you can get much more information that's on our label just by typing in the name of the product. Mm -hmm. Harold? Yeah, I think uh, transparency has really, you know, upended the uh, food system. Um, you know, obviously the growth of the internet and uh, social media, everybody's got a smartphone now. You can find out anything you want or anything that's, that's out there. It's not always true, but um, I think it's really made uh, packaged goods companies, food producers, you know, leverage that technology so that they can talk about what they're doing. On the other hand, they don't want to be caught not doing the right thing. And that's, that's always... Um, been easy then to talk about when there's something been exposed, uh, like for instance, a chocolate company that we worked with a few years ago um, had told us for years that um, their supply chain was clean, there was no forced labor, no child trafficking, and then this report came out that indicated otherwise. Um, and obviously that, that stirred things up quite a bit, not only for the company, but for customers at Whole Foods, where it was at at the time. And um, it forced us to figure out if we wanted to sell the product, um, you know, and deal with customers, but also the, the company itself, it, it really forced them to reevaluate not only their supply chain, but the certifications and the processes needed to guarantee or at least minimize uh, the risk of, of some really ugly stuff going on in their, their, their production system. Um, and likewise, here in the U.S., the sort of uh, growth of, uh, you know, farm to market and CSA, uh, you know, community-based uh, agriculture, um, you know, stuff that I, I've seen grow for, you know, 20 plus years has actually influenced CPG companies where they want to compress the supply chain. They want to be able to say, this is where everything ha is coming from. This is how it's being made, who it's being made, and not see it as a risk or, or a cost, but an asset. This is a way to communicate what you're doing or if it's something that you're moving towards to actually help you talk to your uh, customers about uh, what you're doing, and then to make your make the suppliers, the people you know on farm or in the production somewhere in the production system, assets, partners, so that you could actually differentiate yourself and you know use that to innovate, you know, and talk to and create this community among your your customers. So I, I think that's going to continue to grow. I I'm, I think that supply chains, uh, either virtually or in reality, are going to continue to shrink, um, and I see a continued generational shift. Uh, for not only younger consumers who, who have a growing share of the market now, uh, but, you know, folks coming up who, you know, it's not like with, with us, our age, like we worked for this. It was really hard to create this, this sort of food system. And now you have a generation of folks who, who kind of demand it and expect it. Mm -hmm. So you can't let them down. Mm -hmm. And by the way, feel, all free, feel free to jump in with any, any comments. Uh, we're going to try to keep it interactive. But Errol, I was just gonna. Oh. I was just gonna say. I mean, we're seeing it from the contract manufacturing side, where the brands are interested in what our footprint is in in the process because we're supporting uh, their brands, um, and they want more control of their supply chain, um, and you know that puts pressure on us as a secondary processor to um, get a more competent supply chain and have you know more uh, reach. Um, and access to the ingredients and the type of ingredients that they want. So. 
I mean, riffing off of Errol, you sparked something for me because about three years ago, we started with Hellman's, our mayonnaise, and the soybeans, which is a large commodity that we purchase. We started looking at the supply chain, and the, and, and the conversation at the beginning was, and the realization was, we had no relationships to the farmer, to the, to the actual farmer. We had relationships through our suppliers who bought from the farm. And we have now broken through that in collaboration with our suppliers, where we now actually have one-to-one -one relationships with farmers. They're larger farmers, obviously. These soybean farmers are doing 10,000 acres, et cetera. But we're now creating different relationships, which, which is really interesting. Our marketing and, and those folks that are working on the product are now on the farm, seeing how it's being produced, talking to the farmer. We're showing farmers in, in our advertising, where we're starting to kind of bring them to life a little bit and making it a little bit more human. Um, and less industrial feeling. Um, and I think it's changing us, are changing our company, changing our food products, changing our, our products themselves for the better mm -hmm. because we're learning more. Yeah. I mean, there's an, like, like I said earlier, that for, for us there is an obligation to use our reach. But with that also, you know, sometimes it feels like it's, uh, it's a mix of you know, bold steps and small steps, and it can be quite frustrating. But uh, you need to recognize that you're on the journey. We have, uh, you know, right now we are, we're pulling branded soda out of all of our stores and we're replacing it by a, a carbonated beverage that's a Nordic fruit water. So it's uh, half the sugar of, uh, of regular soda, uh, it's just as flavorful, GMO free. Um, we're bracing for impact on this because, you know, a, a US customer also very much likes their Diet Coke and, uh, or their, their regular Coke and, you know, have that replaced. But we feel you know, it's the right thing to do. At the same time, you know, we're not publicly traded and we have full support of our company management, so we can do these steps. But again, yeah, I, uh, we're, we're unequivocally for the many. We want to read the many, and sometimes, like Errol said, we need to move them you know, together with us. So there's things that you can do very quickly, and there's things that you can't. We have, uh, another example is uh, three years ago, we still, maybe I should say, the traditional serving size for a meatball dish in Sweden, as you guys all know, is eight pieces of meatballs. Um, up to three years ago, we've served 15 pieces in the U.S. in our restaurants. In Texas, we even served 20, which is a family size, right? So, uh, um, and over the years now, we've reduced it. Now we serve a dish because we've been working with the uh, SP Institute, actually, uh, from Dr. Lundin, uh, on a healthy meal norm. We've reduced the composition and the recipe of the dish uh, to eight, including a, a vegetable uh, on it. Uh, it was not necessarily received well from everybody, you know? People like, you know, their big portions. So portion size education is something that's also very, very dear to our heart. But you've got to be, got to be bold at times and you've got to stick it out if you want to move the needle. Also recognizing that I have responsibility for a profit and loss statement right. at the same time. That's an interesting question, actually, that you're, uh, or a point that you're private and, and, and can sort of take a little bit of a longer view. Uh, both of you have worked for a, a public company. Uh, Errol at Whole Foods and Unilever listed on the UK stock exchange, right? Yes. How, how does, does that change the perspective or the horizon you must take when you uh, work on issues of sustainability and, uh, and on your supply chain and sort of accommodating consumers sort of more over the long term rather than the short term? I, I think it could have, except that we have a very enlightened CEO and a, and a very different business model now. So he's been, Paul Pullman's been the CEO since 2009. His first act and the first day in office was to basically say to Wall Street, we no longer do quarterly earnings, we no longer provide guidance, because we play for the long term. Um, and we've built this Unilever Sustainable Living Plan around long term targets, 2020 is the first in target, we've got 2030 targets now. And we're not looking at quarter by quarter, we're looking at are we making progress against these ambitious goals. Um, the other thing I think that he's instilled in the company, and, and it shows up in where we're going, we're not all the way there, we don't have it all figured out, but we're now starting to attach to our brands. For each brand, the question is, what societal need are you addressing? So if you're in the foods category, you are looking at the 16 million kids that are, that are going to bed hungry tonight in the United States, or the 800 million people that are, that are going to go to bed hungry somewhere around the world tonight, or those that are malnutrition, you know, malnourished and, and we're going to provide food fortification. Because a brand that doesn't stand for something bigger in society ultimately probably gets commoditized. And therefore, we don't, it's probably not going to be our portfolio. So that's kind of the, the, the logic. It's, it's long term. Does that mean that the day-to-day -day pressures goes away? No, it doesn't. You know, we are looking at making systemic changes. We, we, have very strict, we make very strict choices about where are we going to play. And then when we decide to play there, 
If it's Iowa soybeans, we're going to go in and we're, and we're going we're to make the systemic change and stay there long enough to make the systemic change. Uh, but we're not going to do that across 50 commodities. We're going to do it across the ones that matter to us and that we're big in. And we're going to have other partners do that. Um, but this is the big struggle, I think. It's, the big struggle is constantly kind of being reverting back to that short-term mindset, which says, I'll just, because I think that's where we were as a food industry in the United States was, everything was short-term. I'll just make the, I'll just, I'll just cheapen the ingredients a little further so I can get my profit for this quarter. And, and lo and behold, I think we end up with a consuming public that says, big companies can't be trusted, I must buy from small companies. And I'm trying to, trying to convince folks that, that that may have been the way it was, that's not the way it will be. Um, we want to be a part of this, a big company can actually model out, demonstrating great behavior, working on, on things that matter, being acknowledging things in public where it gets really hard, but saying it anyways and saying, we don't have it perfect, we're going to tell you what, where we are now. We, they probably will, will come after us a bit, but that's okay because we're going to be doing the right thing. Um, so it's a bit of a model change, but with a big company like ours operating in most of the countries of the world, pick, pick, you know, picking on the big issues, we think, you, you know, we think we're going to make a big difference, and we think working with others, we're going to, we're going to change full, you know, whole systems as we go. Mm. Well, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I think you have to see innovation as calculated risk. Right. And coming from 20,000 hours of category management, we were able to look at what kind of risk we wanted to take in which categories. We had a very large sandbox to play in um, and you know, throw stuff against the wall and see what works. If it doesn't work, don't do it again. But I think what we had, you know, this, this momentum of, for sustainability as well as you know, working for a company that really supported not only innovation but you know, sustainability, we were able to do really interesting things. And one example is we had one supplier and we had like doubled their sales of, um, of you know, beef and, and chicken products, right? Um, over the course of a couple of years. And so he came to us, uh, the CEO who I'd known a long time and said, we, would, we need help with full utilization. It'll, it'll, it'll drive down your costs, it'll drive down our costs, it'll make it more profitable for both of us. And so we had this conversation where I said, well, one of the things that we used to do with, with bones, my grandma, she used to cook chicken soup and chicken stock, you know, the schmaltz, that was a it's Jewish penicillin. And um, so, and he had, so, you know, I have a recipe for that. And then we both started talking about a, a great book called Nourishing Traditions by Sally Fallon and traditional uses of stocks and soups. It was about five years ago. And about 18 months later, we commercialized the first bone broths and bone stocks. And little idea that we have that the, the biohacking and paleo and CrossFit community, we're going to start chugging that stuff as protein drinks or, or energy drinks or, or maybe bathing in it. I don't know. <laughs> um, but the amount of bone broth and bone stock within six months of launching, and he came to me and said, we're selling too much. We actually can't keep up. We now have to go buy bones from third parties in order to keep up with your demand. Could you actually slow it down, which we couldn't at the time. Um, but that's the point. It's, it was calculated risk. It's like, do something new. You know, keep to your values. You know, this whole notion of, of, of selling out or selling your customers short is ridiculous. It's just like, keep pushing forward. There's so many things that need to be fixed. There's so many systems that are broken that need repair. Um, but do it within the bounds of your P&L and do it within the bounds of what you perceive your, your customer mm -hmm. demand is. You know, and reify that, you know, evaluate it, articulate it, and then amplify it so that you can do more of it. What, what is the, I was curious, Harold, what is the sort of, um, uh, when did you make a mistake? When, when did you think a trend, sort of something that the consumer wanted long term? It's in the plural. In, in the plural? <laughs> what, what's your favorite? Uh, we used to call it trial and errors. Right. Um, uh, well, just one example. The errors. Was, uh, trial and errors. Yeah. Was, uh, we, I was just uh, out and about one day, and I saw an old grocery manager you know, from one of the stores. And he just, he just said to me, he said, hey, we're still sitting on a bunch of that goji berry juice that you sent us a couple of years ago. And it was one of those things where uh, superfoods was, was super hot about 10 years ago. And so my VP at the time, I was the division uh, manager here in New York. My VP said, could you buy a couple of tra uh, trailer loads of goji berry juice and push it out to the stores? And goji berries sell great on their own as you know, dried fruit or you know, as frozen, but the juice is awful. I don't know if you've never had it. It's, it's horrible. And so it just literally sat there and like te and managers would inherit it from quarter to quarter or like they'd go on to a new job and like, you know, present their, 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 their successor with, here's your grocery, uh, your, your goji berry juice. Thank Errol. So, um, you know, we had a few, few like that. Another one was maquis berry. But what we've seen are these sort of, not everything can be mass commodified. Can, you know, 
Maki is now an ingredient in a lot of products. Goji is a niche item. Or we tried selling argan oil and for culinary uses. Little did we know it would be this incredible cosmetic product, right? You can't sell a $40 bottle of culinary argan oil. But if you just use a little bit, you know, in a, you know, shampoo or conditioner or face soap or whatever, it sells much better. So trial and error, Siggy. Luckily, you weren't, you were, you were a, a success story. Yeah. And that, one of the reasons why we got behind Siggy uh, is because at the time, this is about 10 years ago, Greek yogurt was really hot. It was actually before Chobani was even out. We were one of the first Chobani customers, but before that it was Faye and some small local brands. And we were looking for what else can we do in yogurt? And um, you know, not only the zero sugar, but the high protein and then the tartness. And um, you know, we tried other products. We tried to do the same thing with other brands that we did with Siggy's. But what happened? Customers voted for, for Siggy's. Customers liked that product. And that enabled us to expand it, not only from store to store, but eventually nationally. Yeah. But I think you can't, you can't be in business without doing mistakes. You know, our founder, Ingvar Kamprat, is, uh, is quoted by saying, only when you sleep, you make no mistakes. And of course, nobody should sleep on the job. So uh, the, uh, uh, for us, you know, sometimes, like I said, you, you're, you take a bold step and you realize that the, 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 the many people are, might not be ready. Uh, one thing that we've learned, however, in, in food is if we apply some of the IKEA principles when it comes to range and offer development, you know, we want to find a smarter way of uh, producing a product or packaging a product or shipping a product. And this reduction in cost will pass on to the customers to lower the prices. And then we can sell more volume, which then leads again to, you know, this positive spiral. Um, and, and one thing that I've mentioned earlier that we're very proud of is this uh, hot smoked salmon sandwich that we've had. Because here we work with the supplier where we used to buy the center cut filet from the salmon from our, you know, sustainable farms in Norway. Um, by then now taking the ends of this fillet that we would not use to sell as a fillet piece, um, we could actually work on the more of the fish, reduce waste, lower our costs because we take more volume from the supplier, and we would come up with a delicious product. So uh, that is one of the reasons why it's on the back of our catalog and why we're so pr proud of it. But it's, uh, it's examples like this that we're looking for. You know, maybe you get an ingredient that is not necessarily commonly known, and you find a way to do it in a, in a different way. And uh, there's some exciting things coming up in February. We were first time part of our IKEA PS uh, collection for food, where PS is kind of where our design is like pushing the limits a little bit. And we have that annually with the, with the selection. So now we're part of food. But I think it's, it's important to acknowledge that you can't always hit it out of the park. You have to you know, keep trying. And have you, have you had a goji berry moment? <laughs> oh, I'm sure I've had many. <laughs> but it, no, for me, it's mostly you know, in my journey in food, it's mostly when you say you, you introduce something like the Nordic food water, and now you know sometimes you know the customer feedback is, I want my Coke. You know, how do we accommodate for them? How do we uh, you know introduce or educate people, our coworkers as well as our customers, also on the benefits of it? And then do we trust the quality of the product to convince them after their first initial reaction might be hesitant? And I think that is uh, um, that is kind of where we are, uh, but we know it's the right way, and we have to stay on the path. Um, to, to try to push the envelope of the conversation a little bit, <clears throat> um, I was reading a book by a, a, an American columnist called Chuck Klosterman. And he, he, he has a book out now that's called Thinking About the Future as if it were the past. And, and his argument is often the things, the reason the future often looks weird when we look at like science fiction that is written 30 or 40 years ago is because we think innovation will head linearly, mm -hmm. right? So what we, for, for example, see is that we see sort of, you know, now we see a big trend towards sustainability. And so our automatic reaction is to predict that the next generation will want sustainability plus, right? They will want what we're asking for now plus extra. But often his argument is that often the things that are absolutely obscure now wind up being the, the monster hits and monster trends 30 to 40 years ago, uh, 30 to 40 years from now. And as a result, the future we predicted 30 or 40 years ago looks really weird when we read about it today. So I kind of want to push you guys to say, is there anything that's like super niche or you know, like barely on the horizon today that most people here would consider weird um, that you think has a shot at being the, our children's future food? I think uh, a lot of our growth um, came from the pouch. Uh, right. Going from baby food from jars to pouches, 
I think a lot of those sci-fi novels had pouches. Right, 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 right. Eating out of pouches. Um, and so, I mean, that kind of, that trends here. The pouch growth is um, substantial in a, in a lot of different categories, like fruit snacks and, and that type of thing, so. So are you willing to stick your neck out for a, what is next pouch. after a pouch or a crazy format? Yeah, uh, I haven't thought, I mean, beyond just um, continuing to try and add more and keep the nutrition of the food and removing you know, layers of processing in, in, the, in the process uh, to keep the nutrients in those formats that are convenient and affordable that everybody can get access to, I think is an important trend, but beyond that, I'm not sure. I think this crowd would be hard to impress with anything that you know is out there. I think what, what I would say is that, that things that we talked about here today about you know, expanding the spectrum of foods that we eat and uh, certainly the, the work that Impossible Foods is doing, this will be the future. This is, people will embrace this at a rate that is unimaginable. You know, the younger generation is a lot more open to these things. So I think that, that is one of the things that's going to happen in the next 10 years, for sure. And then I don't dare to you know, <laughs> go, go beyond that. That's not my, uh, my quality. But uh, I certainly think we'll embrace all these perceivably strange foods in, in, a, in a bigger way, much bigger way. Don't get mad at me. I'm going to make a bold prediction that in 20 years, the vast majority of people eat all their meals at home. That we return to the idea that cooking on your own with your family, with your friends, is actually the norm again, as opposed to less at home and everything else outside. And so therefore, I think, I think this idea that um, the art of cooking, and I think Marcus talked about it last night, but this art of teaching people to cook, learning to cook, um, I think is going to be something that is going to be a new trend. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Harold? Yeah, I, I do think that progress in the food system is, is chaotic and probably a little dialectical and that you, you go a little forward, but you need to balance so that you're not too far ahead of your customers or you cut some of your customers are way out ahead you try to catch up to them but you gotta make sure you're not leaving the rest behind so I think one of the things that we're seeing in that regards is, is science and you know impossible foods and just mayo and other folks who are using like actual you know biology and biochemistry to mimic you know foods uh, but in this, this sort of really creative way so that the mouthfeel the taste the consistency you know whether it's emulsified or a protein is actually you know, similar to what somebody would expect in a product. And I think that we need to wean um, the science community off of the endowments and all the research grants that are coming just from the big food and big biotech and big ag you know, sectors and, and look at it like we need research endowments, you know, like folks like Unilever or General Mills or, or Campbell's to fund chairs to, to do research in, in sustainable science and regenerative farming. In, in ways that you're not biohacking the nucleus of a cell, but you're looking at merging traditional techniques uh, with new trends and new scientific techniques. And I think that sort of a dialectic is how we're going to continue to move the system forward without creating uh, any imbalances or worse reactions like we're seeing in the political sphere. I was going to leave a couple of minutes at the end for, for questions f from the room. Does any, well, we have a question right here, right away. Go for it. I'll repeat the question okay, okay. for you, so, yeah. so. So I'm just wondering, um, you know what I mean when I say that these people are kind of fed up with all these food trends and they're really like, don't touch my meats, I want to eat my cow if I want to, I don't care about this, this is too, I'm fed up with this. Um, and so it was really interesting hearing mm -hmm. the meatball versus the Texas, how do you, um, how do you think about that, like the balance? Sure. I think it's. Uh, Do you want to repeat the question or just sort of? Super. Can everybody hear? 
So the question is basically, what, what about the apathy trend? Yes. You know, the people who rebel against the, the meatlessness and, 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 and sort of the food trends being pushed from above, I guess, sort of to simplify it very quickly. Yeah. I mean, it's, the, it's, it, it's our business model. Like I said before, you know, it's, it's the many. And I think you know, what was referred to earlier is it, it starts with the flavor and it starts with the, um, you know, the proprieties of it, the quality of the food. And then I think it's our obligation to provide better choices. You know, I, I think you know, with all the trends on reducitary and flexitary, uh, that's, that's nice. But there is going to be people that are going to be slow to embrace this. But that doesn't stop me from sourcing meat with high animal welfare standards and uh, sizable, reasonable portions and, uh, you know, and, uh, and good attributes, right? So I can use that and, you know, then educate people on, uh, on the way. And I think more and more people will catch on. But I think it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's our day to day that there's, uh, there's certainly going to be resistors to this. But I think when you catch them on the flavor, and you recognize them, and you fulfill the obligation that you have to the planet and to society, to uh, you know, to pull together a good package. Then I think you can compromise in a good way. I think it, I think it's a brilliant. I mean, maybe you'll define Portland for me later, but I think, I think the references it, to Portlandia, the television. Portlandia, show, yes, <laughs> Portlandia. I, one of the things I was thinking about was that it's the classic challenge for us, right? I think we 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 look at ourselves as offering choices. So rather than trying to define where you know we're gonna we're gonna take this path and just go on this path all the way, we're gonna offer a series of choices within our portfolio. Hellman's has traditional Hellman's, organic, vegan, depending on where you are, what you want. Um, but I think the other thing I would say is, it's I think social media, I think consumer insight work is getting much more refined now, where we can actually have real conversation, much different conversations with our consumers than we've had in the past. Where it used to be kind of a mosaic of kind of faceless people talking to us, if you will. It's getting much more sharp to what, what do people want? When do they want it? Um, what do they expect from us? What more information do they want? Um, so I think there's much more insight coming out because I think we've chosen to listen a little bit differently than we were in the past. That we're not just feeding the masses, the faceless masses. It's now about there are different kind of cohorts and tribes of people that we're talking to, and they all have a different point of view. And we hear the same thing. The hashtag, it's always a hashtag something. That's where it always ends. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, up there. Does it work? Okay. Hi, um, I'm Leah, and I'm from the NYU Food Studies Program. And um, my question is, how do we talk about the future of a food industry where the majority of food producers historically haven't been given a seat at the table and whose voices aren't represented on this panel, folks who aren't white or male? So like, how do you speak for them or to them? Well, we shouldn't speak for them. They should be on the panel. I mean, yes, yeah. that's, uh, but I think that there is a big move towards justice and inclusion and fairness that a lot of food producers are looking at. Um, the Fair Food Program uh, in Florida has expanded not just from tomatoes to strawberries. That's, a, that's a, the penny per pound campaign that a lot of retailers and food manufacturers have signed on to, not just for tomatoes, but you know, obviously strawberries now. You see a huge growth in, in fair trade and traditional fair trade producers, which allows uh, the supplier communities, co-ops, growers to actually have an active role in negotiating the price and quantity of what they produce. Uh, so you're seeing, you know, double-digit growth. You're seeing some commodification of fair trade as well, uh, where you know some CPGs or larger manufacturers are just using fair trade as a marketing tool for minimal ingredient products. Uh, but on the other hand, that's still helping the producers because they're still manufacturing more towards that market. Um, you know, and you're seeing a big growth in, in sort of domestic farm worker campaigns here in the U.S. The uh, the Sakuma Brothers uh, campaign was essentially victorious. A fair trade group, uh, as well as some of the farmer farm worker organizations got Sakuma back to the table to renegotiate um, and call the boycott off. Um, and that's because there was so much public pressure, consumer demand, then even some of the manufacturers like Driscoll's realized, oh snap, we got a problem here. So you know, I do think that we need more, not just inclusion, but leadership from the farm worker uh, and supplier community. And there's a lot of vehicles uh, that are a lot, a lot of trends in the food industry that are pointing that way. And, and maybe next year, that, that's something that um, uh, this, this uh, this uh, uh, conference could, uh, could do as well. Well, we're running a little bit uh, ahead of time. No, I, uh, 
long on time, so I think we're going to call it the last question. Thank you all for participating, uh, and I look forward to chat with you all later on at lunch.